happy International Women's Day, North, South, East and West, and welcome to the uh, talk Politics of Care, which is facilitated through the Gendered Organizational Practice Research Cluster at the Open University, GOP for short. My name is Nella Smolovich-Jones, I'm Director of GOP, and I will be your host today. For those of you unfamiliar with this research cluster, GOP provides a space in which all those dedicated to gender equality can uh, share insights from academic study and practice. Now, before I introduce our fabulous speaker, please note the Q&A pane on your right. This is where you can type in your questions and make sure to take advantage of the like button. Uh, this is how you can vote for questions that you like, and I will make sure to give those questions priority in the Q&A. Now, you're probably already accustomed to events like this, but please note that this session is being recorded so that we can share it uh, on our website for those people who couldn't join us today. Now, um, in for, the, for a dessert, our fabulous speaker today is the global treasure Lynn Segal, whose vital and vast uh, bibliography testifies to her selfless need to share her rich knowledge and insights with others. Her work has effortlessly found a way to homes and libraries around the world, even before the perks of online trade. Um, and this is because Lynn has a way of speaking to the moment. And it takes a special mind indeed to always be on topic, whatever might be brewing on the political, economic or social horizon, and to have something meaningful and valuable to say. And this time is no different, as Lynn invites us to consider placing care at the heart of all aspects of contemporary life and to do so promiscuously, as she likes to say, in face of the pandemic, continuous austerity measures, climate crisis, you name it, um, the cruelty and devastation these bring with them. During this talk, um, Lynn will remind us in her signature kind imperative that we are all dependent on each other and only by nurturing these interdependencies can we cultivate a world in which each and every one of us can not only live, but thrive. Wasting not a second more, I'll pass you now to Lynn. Do enjoy and see you in the Q&A. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Nella. It is wonderful to be here. Finally, sorry about the, le the delay, and especially to celebrate this year's Women's Day, 2000. And 21. So March 2021, exactly a year since we became aware of the pandemic about to upend our lives in so many ways. And words fail almost trying to capture the weight of the world these last 12 months. Momentous for everyone, though momentous in its own special way for each of us. Those of you who've managed to escape the catastrophic global toll of death, loss or long-term illness from COVID-19 will surely not have escaped the fears, forebodings and anxieties hovering everywhere. Nor will most of you have evaded the patterns of endless toil, especially those working in the public sector, including our schools and universities. There's been added grind for parents self-schooling, caring for the chronically ill or other dependents at home, and usually it falls heaviest on mothers, though sometimes with interesting new twists for fathers right now. And there's been huge rises in domestic violence, tragically, with reports to the police every 30 seconds here and women's refuges overflowing. And so on it goes, children's education suffering, Inequalities already monumental, deepening everywhere. And then there's the struggles against depression, loneliness, claustrophobia that lockdown exacerbates with an intensified sort of loneliness among fa family carers during COVID-19. Home carers feeling even more marginalized and more abandoned than usual. And yet, of course, some have managed to find comfort one way and another, though for single people or indeed anyone outside established coupled in, physical intimacies, intimacies have been largely precluded. And though some of us have managed to keep working, few of us are free from worries about the future here in the aftermath of both COVID 
if and when it arrives, and Brexit as jobs and services collapse all around us. And for me, the distinct ingredient is that during this pandemic some six months ago, I retired from Birkbeck, though retained links especially to our its cross-disciplinary cross -disciplinary institute for gender and sexuality, something like um, the center I'm addressing now. So it's a huge leap or fall or hopefully simply move. We'll see, especially though that I have spent 50 years, yes, half a century, a very long time of mostly very enjoyable, unexpectedly rewarding years teaching in higher education. Because happily, this included those decades, especially in the 1980s and 90s, when we fought for and won the creation of women's studies, gender and later queer studies, alongside post-colonial studies, and the embedding of all kinds of critical, cultural, creative, transdisciplinary work in the academy. These were also the decades in which women and soon <coughs> gender studies were launched and flourished at the Open University, quickly influencing other scholars worldwide. The OU was not the first to offer such courses in the UK, which began in the open access WEA classes by second wave feminists, movement activists and budding scholars such as Sheila Rowbottom, Sally Alexander, Barbara Taylor, and those of us lucky enough to attend them, like me, began learning quickly about women's long history of resistance to patriarchy. But once gender courses were offered at the OU from 1983, they were hugely influential throughout and well beyond the UK. Young feminists venturing into the academy, like me, hoovered up and sometimes contributed to the exciting course texts and study guides, all so popular when sold commercially. Also, the OU quickly had the very largest student numbers attending its women's courses. Not so surprising when its open access policy and home-based study recruited a higher proportion of women students than any other universities, and indeed still does. So 8,000 students studied its gender courses in a 17 year period, as reported by Jill Kirkup and Elizabeth Whitelog, Whiteleg in 2013, probably a few more thousands now. So it seems only yesterday then, <clears throat> when the, only yesterday to me, when the very first OU women's studies courses were launched at the o OU, the changing experience of women was the first one. Experiences which have kept right on changing. And these courses were staffed by cross-disciplinary scholars from the OU and seconded from other institutions uh, who worked as consultants. And I'm proud to boast, many of them were my friends, Veronica Beachy, Catherine Hall, later Sue Himmelbeit, Doreen Massey, Helen Crowley, alongside well-known feminist scholars such as Diana Leonard, Gail, Sc Gail Lewis and others. Veronica Beachy, who put so much work into creating women and gender studies at the OU, sadly died just six weeks ago, while Leonard and Massey left us much earlier. But more happily, so many feminists remain teaching you now including my good friend Sophie Watson here today, and they all help change at a academic pedagogy forever, inserting hitherto discounted gender issues into many disciplines, while over the years highlighting the significance of intergenerational bonds and transfers of knowledge. Yet, harsh times, unfortunately, was soon bearing down on higher education as on the public sector generally, especially following the savage austerity cuts from Tory led governments after 2010. And as I've just written about for new formations, so much changed for the worse in higher education in recent decades and continues to do so today. And this is the inescapable contagion 
the contagion of invasive bureaucratic monitoring and relentless commercial commercialization that we've seen proliferate over the last decade, which, as Stefan Collini concludes, undermines the very notion of scholarship, while young scholars waste their very best energies writing, writing grant proposals. And we find that the humanities and social sciences generally are themselves now threatened, though not yet, I believe, at the OU. And what I want to suggest is that the problems facing higher education are actually the very same problems that have brought us to the unique calamities of this last year. The underfunding of the public sector tied in with its commercialization. And what it resulted in over this last year was the UK having one of the highest COVID death rates in the world, as well as one of the most ruined economies. Plague Island UK, some call it. So I want to address now what has brought us to this wretched state before coming to a more hopeful, if sadly still somewhat utopian conclusion, knowing that there's only one way out of the state we're in, which means constructing a new politics of care, one that sees caring practices in which I include education as the most invaluable form of human labor. It's actually, <clears throat> I've actually been reflecting on people's, God. I've actually been reflecting on people's fears of human fragility, loss and mortality for some time, as in my book on aging out of time in 2013. And there I noted the still pervasively negative stereotypes of old people and especially old women, a characteristic contempt expressed by cultural figures such as Martin Amos and many others warning us in 2010 of the economic crisis caused, caused by the silver tsunami of de demented very old people, he writes, stinking out our restaurants and cafes and shops. And he warns of an imminent civil war between the young and the old. Indeed, the necessity for euthanasia for those over 70, which by the way, he is now. Whereas I sought ways of building intergenerational bridges, again, cherishing, not avoiding our ties to others. I was also celebrating these shared bonds in radical happiness a few years later criticizing pressures from the burgeoning self-help and well-being industry for people to appear forever cheerful, rather than joining with others to confront and occasionally joyful surmount what was actually so many very real shared miseries. Yet, needless to say, everywhere that enforced market-driven rationality encouraging only aspirational individualism prevailed with its accompanying contempt for weakness. It prompted a new writing project for me, Lean on Me, Disavowals of Dependency, aiming yet again to stress our need for and our lifelong ties to others, plus our fears of acknowledging our shared vulnerabilities, accompanying the necessity for more welfare to combat combat our ever-growing social inequality near and far. And that, as I see it, were the lessons of 70s feminism. Happily, I was soon joined by others with uh, <coughs> almost immediately five of us from different disciplines forming a reading group, the Care Collective in 2017, to discuss all aspects of caring, which we aligned with solidarity for all those in need. <clears throat> so here we are. We read everything from Nancy Chodoro, Sarah Raddick and Wendy Holway's psychodynamic accounts of care as the basis of subjectivity and as the underpinning of gender contrast to Nancy Fraser's Marxist depiction of care as the key crisis of capitalism today, when there is now barely time for any form of social reproduct reproduction on which markets depend. 
We aligned ourselves in particular with Joan Tronto's and Nancy Fulbright's description of care as all that enables people to flourish along with the world we inhabit, emphasizing caring with and caring about, as well as our more familiar notion of hands-on caring for. In Caring Democracy, Tronto rightly notes that the project of democracy itself fundamentally <clears throat> is fundamentally limited until we address the politics of, of care. And that is so. But soon the urgencies of the moment led the five of us to feel we must mount an immediate call to action. Hence the decision to write a manifesto insisting that care be placed at the very heart of politics. So that's PowerPoint three. Reading about the hundreds of thousands of elderly with very little or no care, daily scandals of collapsing care homes, carers themselves living with in-work poverty, alongside the frightening ne neglect of obscene inequality and the appalling plight of refugees, violent border conflicts around the world and the ongoing realities of climate change all prompted this move and fed into our writing. Now we finished our manifesto just before COVID-19 swept around the world, underscoring every argument we had made and leading Verso to speed up its publication, about the fastest publication ever, I think it came out in a few months, while fanning our hopes that care just might rise up the political agenda, along with people suddenly appreciating our licensed carers and the emergence of new forms of alternative collectively organized care. So that's PowerPoint four. Within months of its publication, our manifesto was being translated into almost a dozen other languages on PowerPoint five. And uh, so this had happened before it was even due to be published. Um, the other, um, <coughs> the other uh, examples that uh, our manifesto has now come out in on PowerPoint 5. But this is a journey we've barely begun, if begun at all, whatever its urgency. At state level, apart from now rolling out the vaccine, the one service that remain in the public hands of the NHS and St John's Ambulance, we've seen so much criminal incompetence beginning with a series of unbroken government failures in tackling COVID-19 a year ago, from the discharging of 25,000 untested elderly patients into care homes, drastic PPE shortages, keeping airports open as the pandemic simply spread globally a year ago, then throwing millions, indeed billions of pounds to global corporations often already notorious for their failures without any scrutiny or tender. Meanwhile, billionaires have seen their wealth rise by 27% over the last year, even as the deaths of elderly people who died in their tens of thousands from COVID-19 in care homes were at first not even recorded. So our manifesto begins by addressing this carelessness evident everywhere. Because we've actually been facing an extreme crisis of care for such a long time. Actually beginning with Margaret Thatcher four decades ago and then hugely amplified since those Tory led government cuts from 2010. And we've seen Beveridge's post-war 45 welfare promises simply turned on their head with a lack of care at every level from cradle to grave. Parents working long hours in paid work with little time to care for children, battling exorbitant childcare costs, youth, workers, youth services all but eradicated, though more needed than ever, rising mental stress at all ages from very young ages. And then of course, there's the ongoing calamity of social care especially for the disabled and elderly, mounting year on year. 
The needs of over 1.4 million people now are estimated to be large, now largely unmet. Those caring for older relatives or spouses cannot access resources or respite, fueling depression, especially for home carers struggling with poverty. Uh, PowerPoint six, please. Public care provision is today largely inaccessible with welfare services increasingly dismantled and outsourced, often to corporate commodity chains, especially over this last decade. And these corporations routinely create intolerable conditions for carers, insecure, underpaid zero hours contracts, curtailing any continuity of care. <clears throat> A recent comprehensive US studies of the effects of allowing private equity to run care homes, for instance, reported an overall decline in inmate and staff well-being, along with a 10% increase in patient mortality. So that was an extra 20,000 extra lives lost over a 12 year period compared with other care homes. And indeed, even ending up costing state, states more by having to pay back up care. Yet this is the same damning model the UK has also favoured. Massive profits have sometimes been made from outsourced care, yet its provision often mocks the very name of care for either those in need of care or their carers. When profits can't be made, commercial homes close down, as many are right now, leaving poorer parts of the UK without any. Hull, for instance, lost a third of their care homes in five years, and York a third of theirs. So many of you here, I'm sure, will know of the calamities this can create. One crucial figure in UK care politics, the sociologist Bev Skeggs, wrote movingly of the dual institutional collapse of the NHS and caring systems, causing an extreme lack of care during the deaths of each of her parents in the north of England. And she described the situation as a crisis of humanity. Neg neglect by design is the name of the game, she concluded. Neglect by design with a 50% cut in adults receiving any social care since 2010, accompanying, of course, the rapid emergence of 2000 plus food banks, I'm sure you all know about, as well as another child homeless every eight minutes, heightened stress in workplaces and homes alike. And that along with rampant rates of loneliness and mental illness. So we've only seen this situation worsen over the last year even as earlier NHS cuts and its reorganization along with partial and ongoing privatization and the removal of nursing bursaries left the UK with 17,000 fewer hospital beds than they'd had a decade early, earlier in 2010, as well as a reduction of 100,000 NHS staff. So that's the cause of our appalling COVID death rate three times higher, for instance, than Germany's. As the editor of The Lancet, Richard Hawkins noted, Britain was already the sick person of Europe well before COVID. So turning to PowerPoint 7, how do we turn this around and begin building a new language of care? Well, we could perhaps start turning this situation around and re by recognizing that care and <clears throat> the need for inclusive caring infrastructure actually provides the only basis for any healthy future society, for any sustainable world. And we also need to begin unpacking our impoverished language of care, addressing all that is systematically devalued it. Care has been undervalued largely because it's been seen as women's work, which traditionally went unpaid, barely seen as work at all, routinely marginalized as unproductive. Yet, as most feminists have always known, 
care is actually the cornerstone of social reproduction, of all that enables people to survive and procreate, and hence is essential to, is embedded within any functioning economy. However, while caring has been gendered, and indeed largely remains gendered, today women and men alike are working long hours in paid jobs, creating a massive care deficit in, re in richer countries. And this is being met by a whole global care chain of predominantly poor, immigrant and non-white women performing much of our caring needs. Thus racism combines with sexism and global inequality to further devalue caring. Moreover, as we've seen, care work is also undervalued, indeed often repudiated, because of widespread contempt for so-called dependency. Symbolic manhood was always seen as the very antithesis of dependency. And the last four decades of neoliberal exaltation of individual resilience, autonomy and productivity have only deepened this disavowal of human fragility and dependence. So ideal citizens today, those most applauded, whether male or female, are expected to be tough and entrepreneurial, keeping themselves fit and flourishing via the ever burgeoning self-care industry. So this pathologizing of de dependency was exactly what was used to justify the deadly dismantling of welfare and the culling of public resources accompanied by a constant media shaming heaped upon benefit broods, as Tracy Jensen and Imogen Tyler note, despite minimal benefit fraud and 12 times as much tax evasion. But caring work has also been marginalised because it can be very challenging. We need to understand that the very notion of care itself overflows with paradoxes and ambivalence often generating conflicting emotions, which we usually choose to ignore. For attending fully to the needs of any living thing often means encountering vulnerability. However rewarding hands-on caring is, it can also be daunting as well as exhausting, confronting us with our own and others' mortal embodied selves. So that's also why it's been traditionally relegated to women or servants, people deemed inferior because they are doing this visceral, tactile work of maintenance. Avoiding caring can therefore enable others to disavow their own inescapable fragility and inevitable mortality. Taking care has been something the poor have always had to do just to stay out of trouble, just as not having to care about others has been a sign of wealth and power, as David, Gra David Graeber noted a few years ago. And finally, the challenges of care and worries over doing it well or even adequately easily fuel resentment in caring relations, especially given its cultural devaluation. It's why feminists mistrusted the mythologized mother-child bond with clinician Rosie Parker, for instance, talking about the inevitability of maternal ambivalence, all those disowned, confused, contradictory emotions mothers are supposed to hide, never to have. So fully appreciating all these complexities and challenges of care, the mixed emotions easily entwining with our capacities to care, also tells us why we must fight for all the necessary social infrastructures to enable and assist us in the work of caring. Today's job markets barely give people time to provide for the essential needs of our own dependents or even ourselves, let alone pay heed to the situation of others. Thus rethinking the nature of care means understanding that it requires time, adequate resources, as well as all our essential infrastructures to facilitate mutually fulfilling and imaginative practices of care at every level. It's thus the very opposite of market values. 
So far from public spending creating the pathologies of dependency, as the right likes to say, the reverse is true. Only with adequate and secure resources can everyone develop and maintain whatever capabilities they have to ensure some sense of autonomy and escape being rendered helpless and passive. Now, disability rights activists have always known this, arguing for a notion of independence and control over their lives, despite and because of recognition of their dependence on distinct forms of care. So a new language of care thus begins by jettisoning any links of dependency with pathology and accepting that we are all in different ways formed in and through our interdependencies throughout life. So this is the route to reimagining a caring politics, which accepts both our dependence on others, but, but also the ambivalence this easily generates while valuing all the skills and resources necessary to promote care in all its manifestations. This also embraces inclusive, creative, cultural and pedagogic practices for fostering people's everyday caring capabilities, which for instance, Jonathan Gross and Nick Wilson, among others, have been pursuing in their work on the significance of creative industries at King's College in London. So care is crucial because we all need both to give and to receive care to sustain any real sense of our common humanity, as well as to help us confront our shared fears of human frailty, rather than project them onto those we label as dependent. For that's the very seedbed for the right. Against their devaluation, even disdain, which has tra traditionally surrounded caring work, it should be clear from our experience of being cared for and attending to the needs of others that we can certainly enjoy caring, whatever its real challenges, but only when we have adequate space, resources, and above all the time for doing it well. So our manifesto sketches out what a world organized around care would look like. We note that our circles of care, such as they are, have recently shrunk to the ever narrower level of the individual or the nuclear family. We want to broaden this out into more expansive and promiscuous for forms of care, learning lessons from current and earlier mutual aid and alternative kinship practices, such as in AIDS activism back in the 80s, we also note the crucial new forms of alliance and care emerging lately in Black Lives Matter or in the regenerative people <coughs> in involved in extinct, extinction re rebellion, wanting to care for the planet, as well as other mutual aid work we've seen throughout this pandemic. But we know that re rebuilding care crucially also means rebuilding our welfare state and community resources from the bottom up as well as the top down to enable us all to develop and use our capacities to flourish and lead engaged and meaningful lives. In the home, it means childcare and domestic responsibilities would be shared by whoever lives there and supported by a range of flexible, well-funded public resources, beginning with nurseries. In our lo local communities, it means an expansion of public spaces like parks and libraries, where not only books, but everyday objects like tools and toys are also available to borrow and share. We've seen attempts at this sort of thing in Barcelona under Ada Calau, and also in the USA in Ohio's Cleveland model. And here, people look to the way Preston Council in the Northwest dealt with having its budget slashed by encouraging localism and workers' co-ops, switching its public sector priorities from using corporate contractors to invest in local providers and worker-owned cooperatives. Other councils, including my own in Islington, have tried making similar moves. A crucial dimension of municipal democratic care means trying to insource 
what has been outsourced, what councils were actually forced to outsource in order to receive any funding uh, for their public sectors, but bringing that outsourced provision back in-house insofar as they possibly can. And once jobs return to the public sectors, workers, of course, gain job security, living wages, pensions, sick and holiday, holiday pay, so that insourcing is itself an act of caring for workers, thereby enabling them to care better for us. So more democracy, more cooperative ownership, and more regulation against the private corporations are all essential for shifting the balance of power, allowing a more democratic use of resources. But we also want to encourage greater experimentation with alternative forms of production, consumption and exchange from the local to the, to the global, with free shops, free universities, exchanges of skills and other forms of sharing. It reminds me that the very first short course on gender occurred in an anti-university organized by radical academics as part of the student protest movement in the summer of 1969, when Juliet Mitchell ran a course on the role of women in society. Mutual aid practices then are always going to be significant, along with other experimental practices like those begun under recent lockdowns. And they tell us something about the possibilities, um, not just for servicing basic needs, such as providing for food banks, but for encouraging creative exchanges of all kinds. And this connects as well with sustainability practices under, under pinning notions of the, a Green New Deal, as the economist Anne Pettifer and so many others now delineate. Such initiatives are essential for any recovery from COVID or the prevention of future pandemics, not just at national levels, but the international, while radically shifting our attention towards the environment, taking care of it, not plundering it for material gain. So it's in these ways that it's only by centering care in its broader sense, developing a notion of universal care, that we can begin reversing the catastrophic consequences of climate change now feeding into the gloom of the moment. So to conclude, while the pandemic did not create the crisis of care, it has made it irrefutable how much is wrong with a political system that cannot prioritise care for people over markets and profits. I say irrefutable, yet sadly the evidence is still ignored by our current government, which seems to have learnt nothing at all over the last year. Its budget last week had no plan for social care, no support for key workers, no mention of inequality, and not a word on climate change, let alone the need for shorter working hours to allow us all to care, or for rebuilding our communities. And yet, despite the ostriches of Downing Street, our manifesto overlaps with the work of so many others who also keep asserting the obvious, such as the feminist economists in the women's budget group, like Sue Himmelweit from the Open University, who recently declared, a caring economy is an idea whose time has come. In the US, it aligns with the LEAP manifesto headed up by Naomi Klein and influencing some left members of Congress now, asserting care is the foundation of our economy and society, the work that makes all other work possible. But we suffer from a lack of a functioning care infrastructure, endangering the health, safety and well-being of the American people. We must tackle the underlying crises that made the pandemic so deadly and that threaten our collective future, securing the material, developmental, emotional and social needs of all people. Quite so. Such ideas then premised upon repairing care are hovering us 
are hovering all around us. So I give a modest proposal in PowerPoint 8. Here's of what a caring world could look like, the message that we all have to spread, despite the market puppets ruling us. Any long term livable future requires us quickly to develop an expanded politics of care, no longer seeing it as isolated private activity, no longer the prerogative of women as caretakers, but rather as a multitude of interpersonal and institutional practices with the potential to change all our inter interactions and even to transform the world. So that's PowerPoint 9. If you have the words, there's always a chance that you'll find the way, Seamus Heaney reflected. We are never outside the social any more than we are ever those autonomous individuals some fantasize themselves to be. There's only interdependence in human existence as we lean towards and upon each other, as well as on all that sustains the world we inhabit. So lean on me and I must write that book. Thank you very much. What a lovely way to end the presentation and what a wonderful presentation in general, Lynn. Thank you so much. Uh, we have received some amazing questions um, and I hope that we can have time for a few uh, before we have to close in. Um, so the one from Anonymous, unfortunately, I would love to know who posed this question because mm -hmm. it's excellent. Uh, do we think that post-COVID crisis offers a real mass opportunity to reschedule life and paid work, or will we be back to an even worse state under the guise of austerity economics? What do you think, Lynn? <laughs> well, that's the question, isn't it? Um, if we look at the budget from last week, we see no signs of any change from this government. On the other hand, you know, I see everywhere, whether it's in my Labour Party board, whether it's in my old women's groups, whether everywhere I look, I see people thinking about care and the need to centre care. So I just I also see an interest in local council democracy in, you know, I mentioned the Preston model here and, and the fact that many councils really are trying hard to work out how to do something about this appalling lack of care that we've seen that created, you know, the terrible conditions for people who uh, died in care homes after over the last year. And, and we know whose who's, who's needs are being so neglected. We saw, for instance, if you remember in um, Sorry We Missed You, uh, Ken Loach's film, the carer there who sort of and many carers who were interviewed by Madeleine Bunting, for instance, who say, actually, they like their caring work. They like doing it because they know they're so much needed. They feel rewarded in terms of the work they do. And yet they're so unrewarded in terms of um, the pay they receive and and how they're regarded by others. They, they often say we don't like to tell people we're carers because they'll look down on us if we say we're care workers. So. I don't know. I see signs of change. I see signs of it changing. I see many, many people trying to change it. You know, and it is there in the um, uh, movements to, uh, 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 like Extinction Rebellion, doing something about climate change and the loss of species diversity and so on. So, so this this talk and there's movement around us, and this movement, I think. In, in some of our local councils, but I'm afraid at the top, at the top, we can't see it. There's also been a lot of movement in trade unions like Unison has put forward very good plans for care and revaluing care and, and Unite also highlights that. I don't know uh, in our own union, <laughs> the University Union, UCU, how much they've said about care, but if they haven't said much yet, I think they're going to have to because uh, so many jobs are under threat. And so, you know, 
our teaching lives are so, you know, um, dominated by bureaucratic rather than caring needs to be teaching. So, so I see possibilities for change, but I can't say I can't say it's really there on the political agenda on the, at the top, can I? Because it's not. <laughs> Yeah, it was a big question, but worth asking. Um, mm -hmm. Let's try with a more specific one. Another kick-ass acti uh, activist, activist and feminist uh, from Southern Hemisphere, Alison Pullen, mm -hmm. uh, said, good morning, Lynn and Nella, so inspirational, thank you. It seems that universities are best place to start the revolution, but they seem hell-bent on destroying care. What can we do locally? Yes. Um well, I suppose we have to uh, work within the unions and we have to maybe even talk to students and bring the whole issue of care into our courses. Lovely to know you're here, Alison, and I do know that um, Australian universities were some of the first to pioneer these neoliberal practices and that um, a lot of academics are now having to reapply for their own jobs and so on. What could be less caring than that? You know, people you know, giving their all often to their teaching work and to caring for students and then being told they have to apply for their jobs to carry on with the work they're doing. I mean, nothing could really be less caring than that, could it? So it does seem one place where you know, where resistance may begin. Resistance has begun in universities before, hasn't it? I mean, it, a lot of 68 began in universities. It was responsible for a lot of those progressive ideas which took over within the universities in the 1970s and 80s. But, you know, it is very tough times. I mean, they've managed to squeeze everything, haven't they? I mean, the whole notion of student students having to pay to learn and huge student debt as a way of actually policing students, isn't it? Um, so I don't know, I can only think of working together, understanding the situation and understanding though that if we don't change it, we really are and are hiding to nothing, you know, we really are headed towards all sorts of disasters unless we begin turning this around. That's why I mentioned the LEAP manifesto and the work of Naomi Klein and Abby Lewis, apart from others, uh, along with others as, as well, of course, uh, as the Women's Budget Group and all those Green New Deals, they're all there. The ideas are there. We know what we need to do. We just know <laughs> that most of those who are in charge of things are not doing them. And we've just got to try and make them. Absolutely right, uh, Lynn. Thank you. Another fantastic question from Amna Sarwa. Thank you, Lynn, for uh, your wonderful lecture. I want to ask you about the coloniality of labour, undocumented workers and issues of care in the UK. Uh, many undocumented workers have been working in this sector. And do you think, is there a possibility of a social movement contesting the prevalent neoliberal logic of treating people of colour as no value lives? There actually is a movement and the Union Universal Workers of the World, I might have that a bit wrong, it's something like Workers of the World, who've been supporting care workers, some of whom are on strike now. I mean, they supported those cleaners at London universities, many of whom won better conditions, you know, their conditions being ones that didn't allow for holiday pay, didn't allow sick pay, didn't even have a living wage. And there's now a strike going on at one of the old people's homes, a sage home in Golders Green, um, where the <coughs> workers are on strike. Very hard, very hard for care workers to go on strike. Um, but simply demanding the conditions that enable them to care better. So I do think that um, um, some of those trade union struggles and this global one, global workers of the world, are crucial and crucial in pushing our own unions to link up with them and pay more attention to what's been going on. The fact that that here we're not being given <laughs> the time <laughs> to care 
I mean, if you think of the last Labour Party manifesto, they talked about the need for a shorter working week. They talked about the need for a national care service. They they actually, I think it was a wonderful manifesto, both 2017 and 2019. It had so many of the ideas that are crucial for actually a livable, sustainable world. So um, I think I, I can only say that feeding in that um, uh, super exploitation of third world uh, uh, immigrant workers that's going on now is going to be something that all unions are going to have to attend to and we all need to attend to because you know it, it it is the basic crisis of our time i do think the lack of capacities to care the 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 issue around social reproduction and the fact that we haven't the time to be doing it ourselves and we can only have it done by importing workers from the third world who then create you know creates conditions in the countries they've come from where where their own dependents are not being cared for and so on it does mean that it should be easier to recognize that care is the issue of the moment care for each other care for the environment and and you know essential to stopping this super exploitation that we see all around us heading us nowhere uh thanks lynn i i think i'm going to combine two questions by owain and uh kristen um both of whom uh, think that your lecture was wonderful that you are a legend and they love you um <laughs> but they're also interested uh, in uh, how we can bring about a change how can we all take it upon ourselves to pursue our own care manifestos in the spheres of our own lives you know all i can say is that there are a lot of people trying i see artists trying i see craft work i see you know in in our communities i'm sure in churches as well as as in you know our whatever political groupings where we belong to as, as well as in our friendship groups. I mean, Women's Liberation started as friendship groups, you know, and caring for each other's children. And um, we tended to imagine everyone was young. I think we weren't too good at thinking about the elderly, but nevertheless, you know, wherever we are attached to others, and we, we are always attached to others if we're paying attention to our situation in the world, that's where we begin talking about how can we care better for each other um i do think the struggle for shorter working hours is a crucial one um as many people uh, have argued like anna coot and others connected to lots of ngos have also been pushing this idea of shorter working hours national care service you know better resources for caring backup uh, resources for caring um, because what happens is of course we often spend more money i mentioned those um uh, care homes in the us charging their astronomical fees and people dying sooner and both the workers and the carers being more miserable but not only did that happen but local states were having in the end to do something about these failures of care it ended up costing more and so it very often is the case just like you know the billions I mean can you believe it the billions that were spent on our track and trace did not provide us with an adequate system and you know and in contrast finally one can see that the rolling out of the vaccine is working and it is working because it's remained in public hands and because it's in public hands too many doctors and nurses and uh, 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 and volunteers of all kinds i'm sure some of you there are assisting in the rolling out of the vaccine because we can see this is something that needs doing and something that is not being done to exploit people or in an exploitative ways and so we join in the doing of it and so i guess it's seeing what can we join in the doing of that's going to you know help us help each other but beyond that um you know think about the refugee crisis think about you know the whole problems of uh, of lack of care of carelessness like the children of calais that 
my friend Sue Clayton has been talking about for years, made a film about, and, and she actually managed to rescue some of those children who are entitled, by the way, children entitled to come to Britain, but Britain would not do the work of actually checking they were there and interviewing them to bring them there. So it had to be Alf Dubs and a few people sort of saying, this is appalling. These are the, you know, this is, it's inhumanitarian. It's a crisis of humanity to allow this to continue. So I think we have to talk more about crises of humanity and neglect by design. We have to think up these uh, powerful, you know, emotive phrases and say, what the hell are we doing? You know, we've got to stop it. We've got to actually do things differently. And it won't even cost more quite often to begin doing things differently. Once you start taking the profit motive out of the running of care homes and so on, you'll find that you know, they can be done differently. And, and, and there will be more people trying to assist and help, as I said, we find with the rolling out of the vaccine now, because it won't be tied in with the super exploitation that's been going on under neoliberal ideology basically for the last 40 years, ramped up over the last 10. Um, thanks, Lynn. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one more questions before having to conclude this session, unfortunately. Um, and speaking of vaccines rollout and um, a question by Jo Bruis. Uh, she says, hi, Lynn. Thank you for this incredibly important and rich presentation. It's an obvious one, but I wonder if you could comment on the pay rise offered rise mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. offered by the recent mm -hmm. budget to NHS staff in the context of okay. carelessness, which is obviously shameful. Yes, well, but it's not just shameful. It's certainly shameful. It's so hypocritical, isn't it? When they were out there, we saw them out there clapping care workers and, you know, essential workers. And then, you know, they know that we are a uh, hundred thousand short of nurses. We know that we, we can't actually get people in to do this work. And they're certainly not going to get them in uh, by giving them such a lousy pay rise that they can't even afford to live anywhere near the hospitals or other places that they are working. So it is so short sighted. And I really think a lot more work nurses now, they're going to continue working incredibly hard uh, until this particular pandemic is over. And then they're going to start leaving. You know, they feel exploited. They feel, you know, we have not been appreciated and they will leave and there'll be an even bigger crisis. You know, so they'll be bringing in more agency workers and paying them double, of course, because they won't give a decent <laughs> pay to um, nurses. So it's so short sighted, isn't it? I don't know why they think they can get away with it. I mean, and where did those billions come from? for the cronyism that allowed them to give resources, like literally sometimes just to friends or neighbours who had no expertise, you know, in the making of masks and so on. And meanwhile, factories making masks were not sent the money to produce the extra masks. So there has to be a halt call, doesn't there? Is Labour Party currently strongly enough arguing for this halt? I don't think they are. I mean, you know, they tend to oppose cronyism and say more has to be done, but somehow not with that punch and verve that we're going to have to need to turn things around. We need it. We, we've got to be pushing for it. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, uh I'm reading questions that are coming in in, uh, in the Q&A pane, and I'm so sorry. There are some wonderful questions from Simon, Chinsia, Caroline, and many more. <laughs> so um, I wish uh, we can discuss them um, here, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have left in this session. Um, thank you all for the thought-provoking questions to those uh, uh, that Lynn couldn't answer in, in here, she will make sure to consider them in the coming days and send, and send you her responses. 
Our next event uh, is taking place on 12th of April in the run up to uh, the International Workers Day, uh, where Sarah Jaffe will talk about Why Work Won't Love You Back, uh, a book in uh, which she examines the prevalence of the labor of love myth. Um, Lynn, thank you ever so much. And uh, finally, tell us uh, what's next. <laughs> what next? Well, I suppose what I next? should actually write Lean on Me and <laughs> Disavow of Dependency. I don't know, because a lot of it went into the care manifesto, but um, I don't know. I hope to be able to keep working alongside others and having retired, that's a little more possible now. But I suppose it will always be reflecting on the moment and those around us and how to bring us together to recognize our ties to others. So maybe I'll work on Lean On Me. Or I also thought of writing more about higher education as I did for new formations, thinking of how much we're going to lose if we don't um, roll back the um, bureaucracy and, the, and also the pressures to publish that we've been uh, living with in higher education, where it's not teaching that uh, is prioritized or connection to students, but somehow our own, just our very own production. It's by the way, what nurses and doctors all say that they have to spend as much time in form filling as they do caring for their patients and so on. It's, it's this that all we have to bring a stop to. So I'll be trying one way and another to work on those things. Please do, please do, please write both of these books, all three of those books, four <laughs> if need be. <laughs> um, to everybody, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please stay tuned for all the upcoming GOP events on our Twitter account, and that you can see on the screen, and hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. Pleasure to be here, Nella, thank you.